Good morning. My name is Dr. Mark Perlin, and today, in two parts, I'll be talking about DNA mixtures. The first part will focus more on background, pr historical problems, what are mixtures, and what are solutions, and some things that we tend to see in trials, and the capabilities of newer systems. The second half will focus more on what happens in trials at admissibility hearings and interesting testimony that can come up and, and tactics. Since you're used to hearing witnesses being qualified, let me quickly tell you about myself. I see these in with the materials. I was born in the Bronx, raised in Rockland County, and then I went to SUNY Binghamton. After that, I went to medical school, University of Chicago, came back to do a PhD in mathematics at City University of New York, finished up medical school, did a quick postdoc here in Westchester at IBM Yorktown, and then was planning on spending one year, 1984 at 85, doing an internship in Pittsburgh. I'm still there. I ran into Carnegie Mellon University, which had a wonderful computer science and artificial intelligence program, where I was faculty for 10 years before starting cybergenetics. In a courtroom, I'd be happy to tell you a lot more, but I'd like to tell you about DNA mixtures today. So what's a DNA mixture? Old-fashioned DNA is just one person's DNA and a lot of it. And what then happens is that the laboratory gets hold of it, they extract DNA, they amplify it a billion fold so it can be detected, then they detect it on a machine and they develop signals that look like EKGs. And it's very simple because we have two parents, so we have one component or allele at each of these tests at a genetic location. And the signal from one person basically looks like two peaks of what you inherited is different, one from each parent, or one peak if it's the same. And a third grader can analyze that. I know I've taught them, so it's not, not hard. But what happens when you take signals at each of these genetic locations from one person and add on signals to another person, and then different amounts of lots of different people, you know, kind of like a handgun with five or six people on it, then people can't interpret it. In fact, people usually can't interpret two-person mixtures, which you'll be hearing about. So a mixture is a combination of biological material that comes from more than one person. And the way crime labs have dealt with DNA mixtures is by throwing out the evidence. That's the way it's been for 20 years. People are not good at solving 100-dimensional math problems, probability equations in their head, especially if they don't know much math. And so that what they do instead is if you have, here I have Pittsburgh, but think of a landscape with tall buildings, short buildings, representing these different peaks and components at one genetic test, one of 20 locations, they draw a line. The line's pretty arbitrary, we'll talk more about that, and all of this feature-rich information of the buildings disappears into tall buildings and vacant lots. And there's not much left of the data. And then, if it's, there's enough data, they'll try to interpret it, but they lose most of the information. The National Academy of Sciences in 2009 had a report where they asked where the science was in forensic science, and they gave DNA a pass at that time. But there were a lot of issues by 2009 about why these mixtures, which are most of the DNA evidence. In fact, if you think of the number of people who leave DNA, if labs are only working with the most obvious evidence and providing it to courts, most of DNA information has been lost for 20 years. So this first half is going to be organized around some of the materials you have. This is an article that appeared in The Champion, which is from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, which is interesting. About 10% of our work is with defenders, maybe 90% with prosecutors, because that's what the evidence is. That's what we see. But this article gives the history of what happened over the last 20 or 30 years, where it all went wrong, with about 40 or 50 articles in the back that support the story. Why do labs fail to interpret DNA mixture evidence? Well, the first scent of this coming from the federal government was almost 15 years ago. And that's when 
the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, which is part of the Commerce Department, did an informal study, which they didn't bother to publish for almost 15 years, that showed there was a real problem. They sent out DNA samples to over 50 laboratories, very simple two-person mixture, and most labs called it inconclusive. This means evidence that might have been used is just not used. And that can have consequences, as we'll see. And then of the groups that did report a statistic, the numbers ranged from tens of thousands to hundreds of trillions. There was just no consensus about what people were doing when they were by eye using their mind and pencils and colored crayons sometimes to analyze these mixtures. They got very different results. Labs knew about it, but most other people didn't know about this. NIST came up with a new protocol. There's so much history. I could be here for two days, but you have other talks to get to plus lunch, so I won't. 2013, they did another study, and these studies were finally published last year after the community complained that they wanted a, a peer-reviewed paper on this. They proceeded in stages. They sent, again, they sent out to labs different mixtures. In this case, it was five different mixtures. And in one of them, by the time they'd hit 100 labs, they kept giving different results. This is at the 100 lab point. Six labs got the right answer on this three-person mixture that in the synthesized lab mixture that the putative defendant wasn't there. 70% actually included the person who wasn't there and gave a statistic, a probability of inclusion statistic. Probability of inclusion can only include, so it can't be used to demonstrate that somebody isn't there, but this combined probability of inclusion means it's across multiple tests, 15 or 20 different tests. And the numbers, again, range from 1 in 10 to you know, 1 in half a million. And this was after new methods had been put forward that got rid of even more data throughout two-thirds of the evidence in DNA samples for mixtures. If there were 15 tests on average after the 2010 guidelines from the federal government, only five on average would be used. So all this money is being spent on DNA for evidence, and it's just not being used, and the answers are usually wrong with mixtures. There's also an issue of bias. You would think that if you have data in the world of modern computing, you take the data, you put it into the computer, you see what it tells you. That isn't what crime labs prefer to do, by and large. Some do that, most don't. Instead, because they are the human expert, first they pick their data. Of those 15 tests, maybe they like the data in nine of them on some case. Then their protocols, uh, including protocols from New York labs that, are, that I've read, will then proceed to have a human expert make the decision. Is the person, or the defendant, say, present or not? Only after the data has been selected and a human expert has made a decision will the computer program of any kind, whether it's 20 years old or five years old, be run to produce a match statistic. In fact, many protocols say if the match statistic don't agree with your scientific expectations, run it again in a different way to get a number that agrees with you as the expert. So it's very centered on the analyst. It's suspect-centered in many ways. And I think it's done in part to overcome limitations of software. You use LexisNexis usually instead of, instead of sending your law clerk down to the Albany Law Library to stay there for six years looking something up, right? We use computers. Unless you don't like the person, but usually not. Okay. So there have been a lot of papers and studies. I've never seen a policy paper or a study that said that these human methods with thresholds and inclusion work that had any data in it. They're just opinion pieces. But over time, people have done studies with data. You'll hear about some more that were done in New York. And finally, three years ago, I... I had some good data, I published a paper, I was quite surprised, and we found essentially no correlation between identification information and these CPI match statistics used in millions of items across the country for 20 years. It just wasn't correlated. In fact, it seemed to be a random number generator 
And ev for every two tests that an analyst considered or put in their report, they got another zero. So if you had two tests, you'd get a 10. If you had six tests, you'd get a 1,000. Typically, labs were using the CODIS low side that had about 13 tests. So that would be about six zeros, which explains something that we didn't understand for 10 years. Why do you always get the same number of a million using these methods? When, in fact, we know that the information can go any, anywhere from 10 to a trillion trillion. So most of the evidence that's been admitted in New York as DNA mixtures, when it wasn't inconclusive, has had the wrong match statistic. And there's a lot of, lots of papers on that, including some from New York, which we'll get into. So what are the problems with human mixture interpretation? It's inaccurate. It has very little to do with the actual identification information that's there. It's subjective. The software workflow introduces tremendous human bias. It's widespread, hundreds of thousands, probably millions of cases across the US, probably uh, 10 or 20,000 cases in New York. And it's opaque. You don't really know why these analysts, their minds, their black boxes are choosing some data over others. They don't use all the data. And it can only include or give no answer. And the main answer that you get from these methods is inconclusive. So I'll be giving you some stories and showing some cases where inconclusive is just not the answer you want because it can do harm to justice. So very long story, maybe over lunch. If you sit down, I can tell you about it. I was telling it over breakfast, how I got into all this. But by around 20 years ago, cybergenetics in Pittsburgh was moving from genetic technology into forensic technology. And we solved this DNA mixture problem in its first form. We spent 10 years perfecting it and making it so that it simply didn't need people. The whole system can be run without people based on the data, run in an objective way that never sees a suspect's profile. And so this was an article written 2013 about the cybergenetics true allele technology, how it uses objective analysis with computers to get results of data that was previously thought to be unusable. This is what, on the left, that's what a person sees. They see their Macintosh or Windows machine with lots of colorful windows. If somebody wants to analyze a case in great detail, it's fine interfaces. If you'd like to just analyze a case and all the evidence items by putting the data into the computer and letting it rip, you can do that too. Computers are shown on the right. It's a parallel machine in our office. We can work on 100 questions at the same time. Many of the labs that use True Allele in the country, it's about 10 of them, they like the workflow where they're not the calculator. And so they typically run about 20 or 30 processors. They just ask questions, and then their job is to understand what the machine does, be able to ask good questions, follow up questions of the machine, and then write reports and explain it in court. So the system is fully automated. It ha even has an expert system inside that does what an IT person would do. So labs don't need IT people for this. It uses all the data. There are really no choices about data or thresholds applied or parameters that are dialed in that make data look more present or absent. And because it's a fully Bayesian system, it doesn't need calibration. It learns everything it needs from the evidence data that it's looking at. On a very hard case where it's looking at a 2% fraction of a six-person mixture, it might take a week, but on easy cases, it can be done in minutes. So depends on how hard or easy the case is of how much searching has to be done. It's just modern technology in some sense, right? You don't have to calibrate Google or make choices for Google. You put in your keywords, and usually of the whatever the number it appears, 945,000 things that were found, usually what you want is on the first page. Okay. So this is an example of what it means to a judge. So here's a case from Pittsburgh. You've got two carloads of teenagers there driving around in some neighborhood and they're shooting at each other. There's a police officer who believes that maybe they're shooting at him. There's a gun that's found and the DNA should help. Right, because if there's no DNA evidence, everybody goes to trial. In this case, there'd be two of the kids will go to trial. 
You don't know who handled the gun, who didn't handle the gun. You just don't know anything. And so th there's a gun that has a four-person mixture. DNA from four people are added together. And you get from the crime lab the result after half a year or a year that you usually get with handguns. We don't know. It's inconclusive. No conclusions can be made regarding the data. So the lab charges, life goes on, and criminal justice doesn't have the information, except in Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is. They, we get a lot of cases from the county. And in this case, I started off actually in federal court, then it moved to uh, county court. So what Trulial does is it unmixes mixtures. So for four-person mixture, everybody's genotypes are mixed together and making this complex signal. Trulial looks at the signal and it separates the genetic types out of each of those four people who left their DNA. Up to probability, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it's a lot more information than having no data at all. And in this case, when the, when the handgun DNA was unmixed, we found that one person was excluded. And uh, that defense lawyer was very happy. The charges were dropped, went off, and they see him flying away here. And then another person, second defendant, was included with a match statistic of hundreds of thousands. And then he took a guilty plea, commensurate with the fact that his DNA was there. And instead of you having to deal with no DNA evidence and trying to figure out in a Solomonic way, you know, is it him, is it him, what's going on? The DNA was dispositive and it didn't go to trial. Which is a good outcome for everybody, even judges, right? That was supposed to be funny. But I don't know, I don't know. Maybe you like going to trial, I don't know. I'd rather not go, I mean. Truly is computer technology, and unlike human review, it's accurate. There have been over 35 validation studies done by us, done by crime labs, done by universities, done collaboratively, done separately. Seven of them published in peer-reviewed journals. The FBI's quality assurance standards requires one such published peer-reviewed developmental validation. We've had seven. It's objective. The workflow removes human bias. I'll show you a picture of that. It's accepted around the country. We've had reports in 43 states. I think at this point we've had about 25 admissibility hearings, two of them overseas, the rest were in the US of every kind. Daubert, Fry, Hopper, Jones, Spencer, mainly Fry and Daubert though. A lot of standards. It's transparent. We have a page on our website about this. We have a four gig gigabyte DVD that contains software, documents, uh, studies, data, invitations to inspect source code, invitations to run the system on your own independently for free, whatever we can do. And whatever we offer, usually the offer is not taken up on, but we offer. And it's neutral, it can statistically include or exclude. And the goal of the system is to produce information, like in the rest of science. Right? It's not to it's just to, to produce a number that's an accurate number. If the number is very big, like a billion, that's statistical support that somebody left his DNA and corresponds to one of the components in the mixture. If you examine against all those components, all those genotypes, and the number is one in a billion, that person's statistically excluded. So it produces a number. If the number is one, it means the data is not telling us anything. Big numbers in, small numbers out. And the workflow is objective. The data goes in, the computer does all of its work of separating after it's finished separating, then it can make a comparison to 110 or a million people if you're using a database for true allele. And then it's the math that decides with a number what happened. And people and their bias are kept out of the process. True allele is used by all parts of criminal justice, prosecution, defense, police, innocence cases, mass disasters. I don't think it's been ordered by a judge yet, and I, I don't, there's no corresponding Rule 706 in New York, so it's not likely to happen here, but it could be used by judges. And it handles almost any type of DNA. Its worldview is there are genotypes out there, and 
the system's job is to infer those genotypes from the available data, whether it's from family members, whether it's from touch DNA, multiple items of evidence, databases, whatever. That's the purpose of the system. So one of our first big projects that we had was around with um, at the office of the Chief Medical Examiner of New York City. Bob Shaler invited us in, in 2005 to re-examine the World Trade Center data. And we were given data, about 100,000 runs. Many were different kits or duplicated for 18,000 charred victim remains. And we started with the data, put it through the computer, and produced genotypes. It could be very fuzzy, but they had information. Fuzzy meaning probability. There were 2,700 missing people, and we had available the data from their personal effects, the mixtures, toothbrushes, as well as family members. If you have a lot of family members, the computer can reconstruct a person's genotype, and then these were compared and provided, the match numbers provided back to OCME. The first time true allele or anything like it with this probabilistic genotyping. Oh, probabilistic genotyping is a term you may hear nowadays, especially in New York. What does it mean? Genotyping means finding the genotype. What if there's uncertainty? The data doesn't support just one genotype, but two or more genotypes. There are multiple possibilities that could explain the data, and they're weighted by probability. Some explain the data better than others. As soon as you move from one to more than one, now it's probability, and then if you have a reliable way of putting numbers to those different possible genotypes, that becomes probabilistic genotyping. That's all it means. If you had more than one possibility and you didn't have a probability, then it would be not called probabilistic genotyping, it would be called inadmissible, <laughs> because it's nonsense. Okay, so here's the first case. In 2007, trooper Kevin Foley evidently is living with the estranged wife of dentist John Yelenick in outside our east of Pittsburgh and kills him in the middle of the night. The divorce is a great story. There have been TV episodes on it and books written about it. The blood spattered divorce papers unsigned are there on the coffee table. It's, it, it, I could talk about the case for two hours, but I won't. The only real evidence is DNA under the deceased's fingernails. The state lab doesn't look at it, mainly because it's a state trooper. So it goes down to the FBI. They look at it. They run their CODIS loci on it. And they produce a typical result for a two-person mixture with low signals. They produce a match statistic of 13,000 using their probability of inclusion method. And the prosecutor isn't keen on doing this massive year-long trial if that's all he has. And so he's desperate enough, or motivated enough, if you will, to let us come in and do our first true allele case. And after much preparation and experimentation with how an admissibility hearing would go and what the testimony would look like and what a juror or a judge might even understand, we finally went ahead. There was a 7% component unknown under the victim's fingernails. When true allele compared that, inferred that genotype compared it with Trooper Foley, the match statistic was 189 billion. The, and that was the true number. And there's a lot, I just gave a talk on this at an FBI webinar last week, it should be online, about the history of that case, a lot of talks on Foley, and why that was expected based on validated science and actually ultimately published in a peer-reviewed journal. But that's not for today. Again, I only have two hours of your time. This is another way that DNA can be used. We had, I had done about a dozen cases for the prosecutors in Allegheny County, and they passed on this one. That trials, we've done 75 cases, but at that point, we had testified about a dozen times. And the prosecutors passed on this because they were going for first-degree murder against a man who had admitted that he killed his two friends who were over to his apartment and was found the police came in, and the neighbor has a gunshot to the kid's head as the kid is calling 911. And he claims it's self-defense. It wasn't any sort of intentional premeditated murder. And this is the DNA evidence. You'll be seeing tables like this. The rows correspond to different mixtures, different evidence items. A blood stain on a living room wall. One victim's 
fingernails, another victim's fingernails. And the columns correspond to different people. The deceased are the first two columns, and Josh Huber, the defendant, is the right column. And what the defense realized was that with all of this DNA mixed in together from all these different people and all over the place, I mean, look, there's DNA under both victims' fingernails. There's DNA on the wall where there's just D there's DNA. Now, the negative statistics that I'm going to show in red, if you look in the first row, the number on the right is 11 quadrillion. He's there, right? He left his DNA on the blood on the living room wall. But the other two people, which I'll try to highlight in red, their numbers are one millions, one in thousands. Statistically, they're not there. So this indicates in a trial that there may have been a struggle. Why is the defendant's DNA on the wall? Why is their DNA mixed together under the victim's fingernails from the defendant and the victims? And so he was actually acquitted of first degree murder because the DNA was telling a story. This was a case in Virginia of a man accused of killing his wife. He wasn't supposed to be in the house. Uh, he came back a year later, and the, the lab, as in the, these other, all these cases I'm describing, the lab couldn't analyze the evidence. The answer was inconclusive. We don't know. But here, there was information. If you look at the first row, what you'll see is that there's DNA on a baseball hat, and Trulil was able to separate the father, David Black, and the mother, Bonnie, from the two children. See those small statistics in red, one in a thousand, one in, about one in a hundred with his children, from the children, Craig and Eleanor. So while the defense was arguing DNA can't distinguish between parents and children, of course it can if software can separate out the genotypes. And so that indicated that that was his hat that he left. And then there was a question of the way it was framed, did he walk into the master bedroom and leave his DNA and not bother going to the bathroom, which would explain why his DNA was on the master bedroom switch, but not on the bathroom light switch. Because if he hadn't been there for a year, the argument would be, well, his DNA should be equally on both. But in fact, his DNA was only on the master bedroom switch. And then the bottom row shows that the argument that it was just his child, all the way in the bottom right corner, that's not true. The red in the bottom left, one in 19, is showing statistically it's, it, he's not there. It's his child's DNA. So by separating out these different components, what actually happens at crimes can be explained. Nelson Clifford is probably responsible for the current district attorney of Baltimore, Maryland. This was a case where Nelson Clifford really enjoyed being a serial rapist, but what he enjoyed more, and he had been tried four times previously, and as soon as he was available and back on the streets doing what he liked doing, he would just go on a serial rape spree. And what he loved most was listening to the experts testify and then talking to the jury and making up an amazing story about it wasn't him and they were, it, it was, it was a prostitute, whatever the story was, and he was acquitted four times. And in this case, the fifth time, there was a belt and a shirt, and the, the victim's boyfriend's DNA was on both items. She was on there a bit, but so was Nelson Clifford, because he'd, he'd been, the victim had been tied up with the belt, and there was DNA on the shirt. And it's a very small component. You see on the bottom right, it's a 7% contributor with a match statistic of hundreds of thousands. And human review, this was all inconclusive. But on these two items, he couldn't talk his way out of the DNA. And he was ultimately convicted, I think third degree sex offense, but with previous convictions, he got a lengthy jail term. Billy Ray Johnson is one of the cases that helped elect the current district attorney of Bakersfield in Kern County, California. This was a case of a serial rapist who would go around and uh, basically terrorize and rape immigrant women and molest their children. There's a lot written about it. And most of this was inconclusive. At some point, he got spooked by a kid 
nine-year-old girl with a phone who managed to make a call. He ran into the street, dropped a zip tie, lots of his DNA, DNA outside of a house, the, or rather the apartment. But it's legal to have your DNA on a zip, car, a zip tie, even if you're found by CODIS. And the only thing that the lab could find was that big number in the bottom right corner of 20 zeros, a one followed by 20 zeros. That's like 100 billion billion. The rest of it was invisible. There was nothing there. It was all inconclusive on these three and four person, two, three, and four person mixtures. But the evidence suddenly becomes really probative, A, when you're identifying someone, and on every row that I'm showing here, there are other people there from the apartment, the victim, their boyfriend, elimination samples. And that number circled in blue, 4.5, four and a half zeros is around 30,000. Scientists write the numbers as the number of zeros. Six zero, a million is six. One in a million is negative six because the numbers are too big. And you can't, they just don't fit on charts. And suddenly that information becomes, that zip tie becomes really probative because his victim is on the zip tie. That's what the blue circle is showing. The mixtures have so much information about who left their DNA together when one person, the defendant, may be claiming he was nowhere near there, and in fact, victim and assailant and other DNA is all mixed in together, and it's telling a totally different story with science. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about this case. This is, was a major case in Pittsburgh. The trial was three years ago. Two sisters from Iowa professionals were murdered in their home in a nice section of Pittsburgh. Alan Wade, a next-door neighbor, was accused of the crime. And the lab does what the lab, most labs do. They applied thresholds. And there were, there were many items of evidence. And this is the kind of results they got. A hat that was found earlier. No conclusions. A cup. Insufficient data. Contamination. Insufficient data. Cannot be excluded. Insufficient. Too complex. So that's not very helpful to a trier of fact. Truallele actually found 17 matches on the same data, including the DNA under uh, the victim's fingernails, matching the six trillion statistic to Alan Wade, and to other items of evidence, separating out the sister's DNA, they were relatives, and helping recreate what happened as he was shedding clothes on that winter night after he left the crime scene ca caught on video camera. DNA is, report, is calculated for different ethnic groups. That may be changing soon to use one combined population. Here, I'll just give you the smallest number, which is considered to be conservative. We were able to report that a match between the right fingernails of one of the victims and Alan Wade is six trillion times more probable than coincidence. Okay, so listen to the language of that. A match, we know what a match is, two things are the same between the evidence and a defendant is some number, in this case, six trillion times more probable than a coincidental match. It's more plain English than much of what we hear in court. And he was found guilty. But it's really important about this case is that six weeks before, a hat was left at the apartment from a burglary. Alan Wade was a convicted felon. His DNA was on CODIS. And if labs actually took solving DNA mixtures seriously and did it very quickly and identified people before they went on to murder or commit other crimes, the two women might still be alive. You may say, well, that, how does that happen? We have backlogs. Well, some countries don't. I worked a lot with the British for five or six years, providing our technologies 20 years ago. They had a three or four day turnaround time rule if you were going to be in the system. So it is possible to legislate that it must be done in a faster amount of time. Also, it would be good if we have incentives. If you're a crime lab, much of your money may come from your backlogs. But the only way you can get the federal money is to have a backlog. There are a lot of perverse incentives like that for making DNA more of a processing service than an information science. This is another article that you have. This is about Daryl Pinkins and Roosevelt Glenn. I think it was around 1989. They were misidentified 
with another man as being connected to a very vicious five-person gang rape. There was this group of, this gang, they kept coming down, possibly from Chicago to northwestern Ohio, and what they would do is they would do a bump and rob. Of a, you know, so they bump a car, stop it, and then people get out, exchange information, they would rob them. Then it turned into bump and rob, <coughs> rob and beat. Then it turned into bump and rob and rape. It really got out of control. And so they were misidentified. <coughs> their clothing had been stolen from their car, which was stranded on the road, and the actual rapist left it at the crime scene. So what happened <coughs> is they went, they were, they were very, actually quite innocent. They were innocent to the point where the people in prison knew they were innocent. They were treated very well because they just, they weren't, it's hard to describe, they just weren't normal criminals because they weren't criminals. They were people who were misidentified. Roosevelt Glenn was in for 16 years, then he got out. Daryl Pinkins was in around 25 years. And the post-conviction court around the year 2000 looked at some DNA evidence generated by a private company where they found the two obvious major contributors to a sweater and a jacket that belonged to the victim. But they couldn't do anything else with the minor contributors. They just, must, everything else was inconclusive. And the post-conviction court insisted that there must be evidence of all five assailants in DNA, or they just stay in jail. So we were contacted by the Indiana Wrongful Conviction Group. This is one of our pro bono uh, innocence cases. And we analyzed the data. We ran it through True Allele. We did a lot. Actually, the defense lawyer, Fran Watson, his professor, the Wrongful Conviction, Conviction Clinic, was brilliant and gave us ideas about what how, questions we could ask the computer about relatives and so on. And so these were the things the computer could do that a person can't do and a crime lab could not do. We could compare evidence to evidence. Usually, labs can compare evidence to a person, not fuzzy genotypes to fuzzy genotypes. We could calculate exclusionary match statistics to prove that the victim and these defendants were not in these evidence items, or parts of the DNA were not there. We could reveal and report on a 5% mixture component. Most labs don't report on, if they're using older methods, but anything below 80% of a component. They only report on majors. The computer could look at these items together from the sweater and the jacket and being a computer it could look at more data simultaneously to pull out more information and mine that DNA mixture. It also is able to show that three of the perpetrators were brothers and there were no, there's no relation amongst the accused. And so it found five unidentified genotypes. The defendants were not linked to the crime. And in 2016, Daryl Pinkins, who you see in the blue shirt in the center, was released. That's his son on the left, who was still in utero when Daryl went into prison. And there's been a lot written about this. There's a very nice 48 hours episode on guilty until proven innocent. Okay, so I'd like to talk about one more case. You also have this in your readings. This is another Forensic Magazine article. It's about suspect-centric bias in mixture interpretation. Because the data are low and analysts can choose the data that they're looking at, which loci they look at, which tests, and the peak events. You know, DNA data has peak events corresponding to genetic alleles, different types that you inherit as genetic components. And there could be tall peaks or small peaks there could be artifactual peaks from something called stutter, which is like shadowing from the amplification. Think of it like reverb on a stereo system. You're hearing it, but it's not part of the original Rolling Stones track, right? There's a lot of analyst discretion, and there have been papers written about it. This is a paper by Idiel Drawer and Greg Hampikian on subjectivity and bias in forensic DNA mixture interpretation. This goes back to 2011. There's people study these things, but there's, there's bias if there's people involved. And so this is a case from New York, from upstate New York. Some of you may know the case. Show of hands, who knows the case? Who doesn't know the case? Undecided? 
All right, so this is a case where the DNA played a very prominent role because it was really all anybody had. So there's a young boy, Garrett Phillips. He's 12 years old. He dies from strangulation. The accused is Nick Hillary. Who's, he's arrested for murder. And the New York State Police collected a lot of evidence. We had a very close relationship with the New York State Police at the time, and there was one group of evidence, like 27 lab tests done just under the victim's fingernails. That's how it started. And we looked at it and said, yeah, he's really not there. He's slightly excluded, maybe one in 100, one in 1,000. The police sent it to us again. They had a newer testing equipment. We said again, he's really not there. Again, Trulio uses all the data. We just analyze it. The computer has no dog in the fight. It just looks at the data. We worked with the first prosecutor who was elected, in, uh, the elected DA, and, and she was fine. He wasn't there. Then she, somebody else was elected, and that prosecutor was less happy with the answer, filed charges, brought in other prosecutors, and then legal aid contacted us. We really didn't work much with public defenders, but there was a very persuasive person who was a friend of Nick Hillary, worked at legal aid, and we said, okay, we'd help. I think we ended up looking at these 150 evidence items. It was about a quarter of a million dollars worth of pro bono work that we put in. We're not doing that again if you have any ideas. It was, that, was, that was overwhelming. But we looked at everything. And we did find his DNA on some items because it was all done blind, and it turned out to be his own shorts. So anything he was on, he owned. There was, his DNA wasn't in the apartment. Some other software, this New Zealand software, called StarMix, they had an expert, one of the developers, who found a match statistic of 10 million that connected the same data from the victim's fingernails to the defendant's DNA. And they identified a, that it was a very small minor component, 0.4%, or 1 in 250. That's maybe half a cell of DNA would correspond to that low amount. And very, very small amount of DNA. And so we took a look at this. We're working with the legal aid lawyers. I know you don't have Rule 702 exactly like this, but roughly, and this is kind of what happened with the different hearings that spring, the questions that the judge, unless he's here and he'll contradict me, uh, Judge Felix Catena, is that there was sufficient data, it was the reliable method, and then the question, in a, an as-applied Fry hearing was the third question. Was there a reliable application of the method to the data? And that's where legal aid was going that summer. So just think of that framework. Is there sufficient data? Well, there's, there's data under the fingernails. They show a low mixture amount. There's very low peak heights for a very minor contributor. So there is data there. The ratio is 1 to 250, which is less than one cell. Remember, a cell has you know, a pair of chromosomes, and there's not much there. And the peak heights that we're looking at on a scale of 0 to 10,000 for this very minor component are all between 30 and 70. So that's the, the victim's DNA is all the way at the top. He's up in the thousands. But the question data, this evidence, it's very low, between 30 and 70. Many labs using threshold methods wouldn't even be allowed to look at it because they're not using computers. Below 100 or 200, it wouldn't be there at all. But there is sufficient data for a computer to look at this stuff. Is the software method reliable? Well, yes. In general, here's the validation data. They have done validations on the top left, mixture validations with ratios of 1 to 25 that have many, many cells, 10 cells, 20 cells. In their studies shown on the left, the peak threshold that they and many other groups used was 30 RFU, which is a low level. It's above the noise, but that would be the threshold that they used. And if you look at this data on the right, what you see all the way on the right is that the circles are true donors, the Xs are people who aren't there, not donors, and with enough cells, three, four, or five cells, their system is doing a separation. So in general, it's a reliable system, even on low-level DNA. 
But the question that Legal Aid from New York City asked in upstate New York is, was the method reliably applied to the data? And so we're looking at this mixture case. The ratio is 1 to 250. It's less than a cell. If you look at the validation study here on the right, we're zooming in. See, here's the validation. It's just going to zoom in at the very low levels, less than a cell, just zooming in. The vertical axis is the match statistics. Over zero means the guy's there. Under zero in the study means the person isn't there. And what you see circled in the red rectangle is at that level of 1 in 250 is the X's and the O's are on both sides of the x-axis. He could be in, he could be out, and the numbers are low. They're around two zeros or 100. So that's what the validation studies are showing from the people offering the evidence. And what also happened is they didn't use 30 RFU. The analysts who worked at the software company chose to use 50 RFU in this case. Okay? And so what was found was that he was there, and the match statistic was 10 million. We had a copy at Cybergenetics of an evaluation software for this program, and this is one of the reasons why it's so crucial with software that defendants have access to run the software. They don't need the source code. They don't need its private secret documents. They just need what you would have with any technology. If you want to test an iPhone, you need an iPhone. Right? If you want to see if somebody made a mistake or made choices that affected an answer, you need to be able to run the software. So defendants do need access to software. And we ran it, and what we found, this is under two different conditions. It's technical all stutters versus data choices. I won't go into that. And these are the match statistics. And you see the row corresponding to 50 RFU. There are numbers over 10 million. So with a threshold of 50 RFU, he's there. But with a threshold of 40 RFU, he isn't there. And at the validation threshold of 30 RFU, he isn't there. So with any software that requires human intervention and the setting of parameters, choices of data, dialing in other statistical parameters, all of which are done with most software, if you make different choices, you can get different answers. And this case was extreme enough that the software didn't agree with itself when the inputs were changed. And the data in that range from 30 to 70, if you were over 50, he's in. Under 50, he's out. That's one piece of software. Again, this, this is why people need access to software and the need to test it. I'm not going to describe this whole chart here. It's just showing the different data. Instead, I'm going to focus your attention on the bottom chart. You see it says victim, foreign, and defendant. Those are what was reported and put into the computer program. You see the letters V for victim, F for foreign, and D for defendant. Three alleles were over that threshold or not considered stutter or artifact. And when you only looked at that much data, you got one result. But if you looked at all the data, including the five alleles that the analysts chose not to put into their program, corresponding to the lower peaks, that choice of data impacted the answer. That's a human choice going into a computer program. And if you pick and choose the data one way, you'll get one answer. If you pick and choose another way, you'll get another answer. And so in this case, on an as-applied challenge, even though that program is considered to be reliable and accepted and passes fry, as Judge Katena said about the expert, because the expert was forced, in the second paragraph it says, to pick and choose data and pick and choose the input parameters for a program that requires a calibration to be done during the validation in order to reasonably set those limits, it was precluded. Now, other statistical software like fully Bayesian methods, tens of thousands of applications in science, including Trulial, there's no issue of needing a calibration. It learns from the data. It's an AI program. But most software doesn't have that many variables in it in forensics, and they require human input 
choose data, set thresholds, choose parameters, and historical calibration data from the lab on clean samples in order for the program to run properly. And so that's what happened in this case. And Nick Hillary was acquitted in 2016. And, a, and there'll be an HBO show on this if you want to see everything except the DNA and the science. I don't think they talk about it much. You heard it here. And you have the article. You can read about it. That's coming out next month. So why don't we stop there?